Can we go back to your script reading days? First off, what qualifies someone as a script reader? Like, how do you, how do they know you're ready to be doing coverage? It's so funny. Nothing, nothing qualified me at all. Um, I got the job and they started shoving scripts in my hand. I had no qualifications for that whatsoever. And that's the truth. I got better as I went. Like, I'm sure my first synopsis was kind of like, what the hell is this? But I'm doing three a day. So eventually I'm getting better and better and better. And that's the thing too, like nothing, nothing qualifies you in this industry. Like if you want to make films, if you want to act, whatever you want to do, there's no qualification. People were like, it's not like every other job. And so, but at the same time, the problem is the whole world doesn't, it is the same when it comes to experience. That's the difference. It's not the same as a qualification as, oh, I went to Harvard. I'm, oh, of course you're, you're qualified to do this job or not. And it's more about, oh, you've done 15 movies. I've seen you have the, the qualifications in the way that I put a camera on you and you're not going to get nervous. You know what I mean? You're going to deliver and, and all that kind of stuff. It's very different in that way. And really, the people I see succeed um, are the people that never give up and keep keep learning and getting better and better and better. And, and it's very rare to see that because certain people get to a certain age and they want to have babies, they want to do certain things. And certain things are pulling them in different directions. And, you know, it's very hard to keep trying to do the same thing if you haven't hit the ideal of what you, you know, imagine. But a lot of people come here and say, I'll, I'll give it a year, like I said before. But it's like, would you, if you wanted to be the CEO of Apple, would you give it a year? Because that's what this is. If you're like the lead in a TV show, you're a CEO of that company now. You're the face of that TV show. Everyone is putting millions of dollars behind you. So you better be good, really good, you know, and have no work your way up and, and, and you know, be the CEO of that company because that's what you are at that point. So that's, you know, and the same thing with the director in a movie. Like, if you, they give you 20 or $40 million or $100 million to make a movie, I mean, the money speaks for itself. You're a CEO of that company. You're completely in charge of making that a good movie or a bad movie at that point. So it takes time to get that good and to get people to believe in you, you know. So you didn't have, like, sort of the qualifications that you thought you would have had to have been a script reader, or you were just surprised that they entrusted you? Um, it, it was, it was mind blowing to me because before that point we would, uh, me and my brother were writing scripts back in Oregon when I had no connections whatsoever and we would meet a guy that could get it to somebody else. I was now on the other side of it all, reading the scripts. And I realized when I was writing them, they were handing it to the intern that has absolutely no qualifications and might just not like my script. No, you, you mostly everyone reading a script has no qualifications whatsoever. They read it, and then if they like it because of their opinion, it goes up the ladder with someone else who has more experience, someone else who has more experience, and eventually maybe someone who really can look at a script and dissect the whole thing. But you have to get through all these other layers of people that really don't know what they're doing. So you better, it better be so good that they read it uh, and are just so intrigued by it. But it also can just be you ran into the right people, the right three people that loved your script or loved your idea or whatever. So, no, mostly everyone reading a script has no qualifications in the beginning at a studio. So the bottom layer people have no qualifications. And so would you ever stop reading a script or you had to, your job was to read it all the way through? You're doing three scripts a day. So, I mean, if I read and it's just horrible, the first 20 pages, I'm going to try to sum up the, the script the best way possible. I'll go read the last 15 pages. And most of the people in the office would tell me that. They say, like, um, somebody in there I remember was like, just read the first 10 and the last 10. Decide if you like it, and then you might read it. But otherwise, that's all that matters. Like, if it's not good there, like, get rid of it, you know? So, yeah, so I ended up doing that sometimes, and I felt bad for people, you know? But if it was bad, it was bad, you know? I mean, that's the thing. Like, when you have a stack next to you that's 20 scripts, am I really going to not everyone's going to get an opportunity. So if your first 20 pages, are, there's no bad. The whole thing has to be amazing. So the first 20 pages are bad. Well, then your script's done. It's not going to get to the next level. So, and actually now that I've made a film, uh, distribution companies tell me like that first 10 minutes of your movie better be amazing. Like, because people will turn it off on these streaming platforms. So you better put a lot of your budget in, in that first 10 minutes, have a chase scene, have a gun scene, have whatever captures them. 
high drama, you know, something to drag that audience in and capture them, you know, because everybody's attention span is so short nowadays. So, yeah. And then what was coverage like? If, if, if you, even if it was just the first 10 and the last 10, how much, uh, like, what are you filling up on a piece of paper of coverage? What was it like? So I wouldn't actually write on the script. I would just write a one page synopsis and try to br basically make an outline of the script. Um, Really, if you did coverage on your own script, you'd be saving people a lot of time, to be honest with you. Because Hollywood people want your movie in one sentence. And then if they're intrigued by the one sentence, they'll want to read a paragraph. So if you write one sentence that sums up your movie, great. Then write a paragraph that sums up your movie, great. Then have a one-page synopsis that sums up your movie, better. And then have the script. And if you handed that to somebody, they would love you to death. because. And you can master getting each one of those great, because otherwise the intern's going to write, write your one-page synopsis when you could have done it yourself in a way, or your one-liner or your one paragraph or whatever. So that's kind of how it is. And so then you got the Hangover it landed on your desk, or someone else? They already it? loved Hangover. Oh, I didn't. I, I didn't greenlight Hangover. They already had Hangover. They liked Hangover. Um, that was one of the two scripts that they were developing at the time, and they were like, it was that and, a, and another script called Man Witch. And when they were like, these are our two movies that we're going to make, check them out eventually. Um, but at the time, all the excitement was over the Man Witch movie, not over ha The Hangover. And uh, that was the next movie they were going to make next, not Hangover. And I was constantly like, and maybe Todd always knew he was going to do Hangover. I don't know. I wasn't really talking to Todd that much. I mean, he came in the office and once in a blue moon, you know. Um, Scott Butnick was his partner at the time. And so I had a lot more interaction with him. And... Uh, for me, when I read it, it was just, you know, it was very funny and it was, it was a page turner because it's a murder mystery. They're trying to find their friend. So it was all solid. It was good. And someone else actually wrote that script and then Todd and his partner rewrote that script. So they didn't actually write the first draft of it. So, um, and they went on, I think, to do some other movies and stuff. But yeah. So then eventually you saw that you could become that guy or that girl and you'd be making a nice living, but you wouldn't be doing exactly what you wanted to do. Did you plan to get out? Or was it one day where you just threw a bunch of papers up in the air and walked out? What happened? No, no. Um, I mean, I was only at each place for like three months anyway. And both of the places, I mean, both places, it was, it was kind of a short-term thing anyway. So it wasn't like I had to go, oh, I'm leaving. It was kind of like, well, you, the time is up that you were supposed to be here anyway. So that was nice in a way. It didn't I didn't get promoted, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. it, it's very hard for people to turn down money when you first get here. So a lot of these people, it was like, oh, now I'm at 50,000. Oh, now I got 100,000, now I got 200,000. I'm making 300,000 a year. I have a wife. How am I supposed to leave this job? You know what I mean? Your money depended on that job. And I'm lucky they didn't offer me a position because I might have tried to embrace it, you know, which a lot of people do embrace their nine to five jobs and give up on their dreams. And, um, I'm lucky that I was raised by my father and, uh, and my mom and my dad always instilled in me, you can do anything you want to do. You just have to go for it and not take no for an answer. So that's, that's kind of my mentality with life. You got to go do it. Did you see that in him? Did he do it? In my dad? My dad actually was a, a musician back in the day and uh, he, uh, he was almost the lead singer of Aerosmith when Aerosmith like, uh, was having drug problems and stuff. And there was a guy named Arthur Mann, basically, that um, put a contract in front of my dad and was like, I want you to perform in every club, bar, stage from here to China. Um, and uh, my dad had, uh, unfortunately, my, my mom was pregnant at the time and he, was, he decided to, and he had a real job. And so he gave it up and he became a, a family man, really. And... Uh, the, the same contract, Arthur Mann gave it to Bon Jovi. So Bon Jovi ended up becoming Bon Jovi, and my dad ended up being a, a dad. And, uh, and shortly after, unfortunately, my dad got in a bad car accident, and so he ended up being a stay-home dad, and my mom worked. And so my house was very reversed, I guess, in the 80s. More people, the mom stayed home, and my dad was the stay-home dad. So um, it was very different in that way. And uh, kind of crazy, though, because... He trained my sister how to sing. And so my sister is Zizi Ward. She's a big time singer. And so, you know, the next generation still made it as a singer. She's signed to Hollywood Records, which is Disney. And uh, she's working on her third album now. So um, it kind of, 
he passed up his music dream, but she accomplished it. So it, it's kind of nice to see that full circle for him, you know, so.